Hey, Patrick. <clears throat> How are you? Um, well, we were just talking about overthinking as we were logging in. <laughs> are you an overthinker? Story of my life. Um, <laughs> no, actually, I'm not. I think I'm. I'm very good at the big picture stuff. It's the little, like this kind of stuff, which is logistics around stuff. I definitely make it more complicated. But with the big picture stuff, I don't overthink it, actually. Oh, that's awesome. That is a skill. So, oh, sorry. What were you going to say? Nothing. I was just smiling because I was thinking, now if I could just translate that into all the little things, I'll be, I, I'll just be, I can just go sit on a mountainside and meditate. Well, there. you know, there is a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Yes. <laughs> Kidding. Um. It's great to have you. And um, this is one of my favorite, favorite topics. And I actually wrote an article about sort of mastering your social media FOMO in 2024 that LinkedIn chose as its idea of the day, which was lovely. And um, what, what I wanted to talk about was when I saw all the end of the year posts in December and even January from colleagues and um, and people that I follow. And it was like, oh my God, they're so amazing. And their year was amazing. And they did a TED talk and wrote a best-selling book and mm. saved the world. And I would just feel tremendous amounts of anxiety, sort of FOMO, and also jealousy and envy sometimes. And it was messing with my head. And um, I sort of had to acknowledge that and then also acknowledge that that's really the point of social media right is to incite strong emotions so we take an action and that um i could know that and you know calm down but also that like the truth is to be successful these days you need a presence and a lot of having a presence is creating that little bit of fomo that makes people think oh man that's that's where it's at I need to, I need yeah. to work with that person. I need to listen to that person, you know? hundred percent. And I think that is where the trap begins to be set. Mm. Uh, because I just had this conversation this morning about financial FOMO. You're oh, watching, God. you know, think about like crypto, uh, all the crypto things because crypto was like hot then it's not it's hot enough but you 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 have all these people on reddit forums on tiktok on instagram who talk about crypto as if they've become the next whales and <laughs> the word I mean? of crypto totally yeah and then but you have no way of auditing them and i so i was i just came back from los angeles and i'm in this new documentary, I'm one of the commenters. It's called This Is Not Financial Advice. It's out Ooh. now on streaming. It's on Apple everywhere. And um, it is about these speculators who are, and it follows this amazing guy called Pro who rides Bitcoin from 108. He puts everything he has into uh, into Doge, $180,000, rides it to $3 million, never sells, rides it back down to like $180,000. He was on the daily. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's amazing, yeah, yeah. right? Oh my god. So 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 what is the lesson there? Well, I interviewed him for my podcast. It comes out in the next two weeks. And he's like, if I hadn't had a following, I would have sold. But because I was doing it for my there was this like esprit de corps and this mission, and because I got famous for being an influencer, I couldn't sell. Mm -hmm. I was doing it was more than about the money. And so I think that is what we have to realize is like when people are out there talking about their achievements, which by the way, yay. But like we all, like I can tell you, I had a Ted talk. It did really well. Did it change my life? Zero percent. Like nothing changed. Come on. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just, that's what it is. Like 2 I million know. views. Like I still have to get up in the morning and brush my teeth. I'm not living in Malibu on the, you yeah. know, overlooking the water. Like it, it's so all of that stuff, it looks really good, but like, and it's really easy. I feel the same way that you do. I get all stressed out. What I think we can do is use it as a sense of motivation to say, I feel FOMO about that TED talk that the person did. Well, maybe I'll do one this year. Maybe I'll find a way to do a TEDx. Let me get on that journey. Let me find out what it really is all about. And when I get there and I get to the top of the mountain, I'll realize like, it's just another thing. It's nice, but it's, it's not going to change my life. It's not going to change your life. Um, mm. 
I'm going to acknowledge that this conversation may sound shallow given the state of the world. Hundred percent. Sorry. There's a lot of yeah. privilege. No, I'm. Don't be sorry. I'm. This is my disclaimer, <laughs> and there's a lot of privilege here. However, I also want to acknowledge that I know because I'm often on LinkedIn that this is a very <laughs> common feeling and relevant. So two things yeah. can be true. Um, yeah. I have two things to say. One is. Um, I, I had an influencer um, arm of my my political consulting company, and um, a lot of influ influencers would talk about being fake rich online. You know, sort of yes. like the Real Housewives on Bravo. You're you're like, are they really rich, or are they just rich for the show? Like, is that really their ten thousand handbags, or are those just props? And part of our digital age is the ability, obviously, to construct fantasy. And so you may look at some of your favorite thought leaders and think, exactly, they are there in Malibu. They may not be, and we'll never know. And that's that's probably appropriate. <laughs> yeah. You and know? it's okay. I mean, like if somebody wants to project an image of themselves, we all know, like we've all seen enough documentaries to know that you have these people who are projecting outward lives that are fantastic, but behind the scenes, it's either not true or they're deeply, deeply unhappy. And that sucks. But that's okay, you know, I mean, it, it, to acknowledge that. And if people choose to do that, it, you know, it is their choice. It may be unhealthy for them, and we may want to help them to do something else. But like, that is something that happens this modern age. But the really dangerous part is to start to create an internal narrative in your head that all of that is true. And therefore, whatever you have is not good enough. And you start devaluing because many of the things, I mean, this is the big lesson of life. And when I think about FOMO and my own FOMO, which I have all the time is what, it's like, what are you really, what are the really beautiful, valuable things in life? Like they, most of those don't cost a thing. Yeah. Right. It's like that song. I think it was JLo, Love Don't Cost a Thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Neither does like many of the stuff that we value. And so what I try to do and I encourage other people to do is to say, yeah, okay, there are things that I want and great, I'm motivated and I can use those, whether that's the job or the trip or the party or whatever, that everybody has their own metrics they're trying to optimize. But how do we in our daily lives identify the small things that don't, that are very accessible to us that we underappreciate mm -hmm. in order to make our lives more enriching and, and to value them? Because, you know, it's so often, I had this wonderful priest that I interviewed when I wrote my book about FOMO and he was like, you know, everybody has FOMO until like something bad happens and you're at the hospital. And then you're like, your priorities are so clear. So if we can, you know, recognize like spending time with our parents right now, it's like, you know, maybe I could think about all my friends are on some fun trip or whatever. Or I could be doing, no, no, no. Like if you can appreciate that moment and recognize that you are ignoring the FOMO to consciously value what's really, truly important, that has tremendous psychic value tapping into what are my values. Mm -hmm. Um, Mariam says, I think FOMO is a root that leads to emotional instability. Do you agree with that, Patrick? I do. And in fact, it's a very good comment, Mariam, because what happens is, um, and I interviewed this really amazing guy. This is like the perfect interview subject, uh, for me because he's a neurobiologist. So he's a mm -hmm. brain guy, PhD. Mm -hmm. But he is also a practitioner of Buddhist meditation. Hmm. So he is able to thoughtfully bring together the scientific and the spiritual, I would say, or you know, however you want to characterize that. And what he says is when we have FOMO, we are creating an inner narrative. We are creating a, we are telling a story to ourselves that is an internally driven written story that is disconnected from reality. There are pieces of reality to inform it, but then we start writing a story and we spin mm. and we start to tell, a, you think of it, the story becomes more and more fantastic. Like Mora, like, like I'll do this with you because you're wonderful. Like Mora, book and podcast, very successful, like better than mine. Her, she's got way more influence than I do. What am I doing wrong? she must spend more time on it or does she just smarter or whatever? And then all of a sudden I'm starting to devalue myself. And by the way, like, I don't know anything. I have no idea how many people read your book or, or, or listen to your podcast. But in my mind, I am already putting myself in a place where I have failed versus the benchmarks that I have assigned to you. 
that is not healthy for anybody. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? Not healthy. Um, oh, so many questions. And, and I just want to highlight Maggie's comment. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks for normalizing FOMO and achievers. Look, it's the anxiety that keeps us achieving sometimes, right? It just is. Patrick, tell us, I'm sure you, I know you've told the story a million times, but like what in your life, in your psychology led you to invent this concept, to name something that is universal, but maybe didn't have a name? So it is definitely coming from the achiever place, not the paranoid place. I've never had, that is not, has, has not been my challenge. My challenge has been since I was a little kid, I was, I had to be perfect. I had to be number one in everything. I was utterly competitive, like to the mm -hmm. point where when I was a senior, this is like, I've never told the story. Get ready. When I was a senior in high school, I overheard a group of teachers talking about the fact that I was toxically competitive. Whoa. I was a grade grubber. A great, yeah. what's a grade grubber? Like I would go in and I would get a grade and I'd go in and be like, can we work on this? Like, <gasps> I feel like it should have been a, you were that kid. <laughs> I really was. You ever seen the movie election with Reese Witherspoon? I was that. I wore a blazer to school. Oh my God. In a public high school in Southern Maine, I was wearing a blazer. No wonder I was unpopular. Like it was really intense. I was deeply intense, deeply intense. And so I was the, like the, I have to win because I need to like, I, I, I didn't fit in where I grew up. I was like, what am I doing here? Like among, you know, just, I just was very different. You know, I was like the, mm -hmm. I was wearing a blazer. Everybody else was wearing like hunting clothes. And so mm -hmm. my, my response to that was I must win all the time so that I can achieve my goals. Alex B. Keaton style. That was who I was. Um, and so what does that mean? That means that I don't want to miss any opportunity where I can succeed to build my resume, to move my career forward and all that sort of stuff. And then uh, I had a, a a pretty fundamental experience, which was that I was in New York City on 9-11. Were you here more too on 9-11? I was in London. London. I was working right. in so London. You, you remember that day? And and it was such a moment because I thought to myself, you know, I've done all these things. And yet the world that I'm living in, I have no idea what's going to happen. I must, I must step on the gas and do even more. I must live every wow. moment even more. Like carpe diem. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I took the GMAT on September 10th, 2001. What's the GMAT? And, uh, this, the test to get into apply to business school. And so I had, a, I had a, gotten a really good score that night, nine 11 happens or the next morning. And then I was like, I must escape this city and go. And I applied to Harvard business school, which I had no hopes of getting into. Cause I didn't even know anybody had really gone there. I'm like, you know, that is like, what is that about? Huh. I managed to get in and then I got there and I was like, this is my big chance. I'm a blue, like blue collar kid from Maine. I'm now in this like super amazing place with all these opportunities. I must win. I know how to win. That's my playbook. But mm. what happened was I tried to do everything all the time, socially, intellectually, because I'd spent my college years in the library. I'm like, I'm also going to be social too. And I just found myself to be, despite the fact that I was at every party, every job interview, every everything winning i was deeply stressed out anxious and mm -hmm. pretty unhappy i was like mm. and so How old I, were you? I, I was 27 years old and i just remember saying to people like this isn't normal like this is whack like i i don't know what this is and i started calling that feeling the fear of missing out when people would be like why did you go to six birthday parties saturday night and four company presentations on saturday uh, friday afternoon I would say because I, I I have FOMO. I don't want to miss out on anything because it's my big chance to make it. If I do well here, I'm on a glide path to success. Of course, like the universe teaches you that's all very unrealistic. <laughs> but that was the moment. And I identified that term and I wrote an article in our school newspaper. It was the first time it was ever used anywhere. And, you know, here we are. Wow. Well, what did it tap into? It's so, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like imposter syndrome, right? It's that it's that word that sort of just hooks into this deep vulnerability that almost all of us feel. I have a very elderly dog behind me who's probably going to make mm. rude noises, so <laughs> I love that. <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't have FOMO. You know, when you get to he that has, age, you just don't. He has you just zero. Do. No, he does have FOMO. For what? Cat food. Oh, ooh. He's like, I don't want to eat dog food. I want to eat cat food. 
I mean, so, there you go. I, I tell you something. Sometimes when I see cat food, I want to eat it. Too. It does look <laughs> delicious, by the way. Kibbles and bits or whatever. No, it's dog food, but you get my point. Um, Yeah, it is that for me. So for some people, FOMO is a fear of being left behind. And mm-hmm. I think that was it. I was always the kid. I was picked on. I was a nerd. I was like quite overweight in high school. They called me Fat Pat. Um, oh yeah, I, I suffered all that stuff. So as a result, I went through this kind of swan transformation in high school where I sort of like pulled myself together and did really well in school and, you know, was like the president of stuff, whatever. But I had a deep, deep desire, which exists with me today to be loved and to be liked. And I think as a result for me, I didn't want to be left out of anything. I wanted to always know that I was going to be in the room I was going to be, you know, offered the opportunity. I was going to get the job interview. I was going to be invited to the party. And that was like really deeply rooted in me. Because remember, this is pre-social media when I invented FOMO. Oh, this was, Lord. You know, yeah. there was there was Friendster. Remember Friendster? Yeah. Huh. And so I think that, you know, so to to step back and think about that, what you know when, when it was a niche problem, like it was, it was definitely like people felt it, but it was different. There was less data, you know. Mm-hmm. But now where does FOMO come from? If we think about it from a scientific perspective, it's two things. We want more. We're, is, we're, we're, we, we as humans, we, we, are, uh, we are highly motivated. So we want bigger, better, more. And we want the dopamine hit of that. Yeah, That's the aspirational element of FOMO. The second part is the fear of being left out. It's the fight or flight. It's the epinephrine of saying, everybody's doing this. I'm the only one who's not doing it. And these are biological responses that go back to the earliest humans. But when you add those two together, that's the FOMO. And I think for me, you can see that combo. I'm ambitious. And also I want to be loved and accepted. There you go. (laughs) Look, but, but the moral of the story is, is that that combination is behind many of our most successful people. Almost every politician I've ever interviewed. And um, I had a really great conversation actually this week with representative U S representative Adam Smith from Washington state. Who's the ranking member of, the House Armed Services Committee, very, very open and honest about his depression and anxiety. Mm. And, you know, only recently put together sort of that growing up with such an amount of fear, insecurity, and, and, and again, the feel, the feeling that I must, I must be lovable. I must be the best. I must achieve, um, really got him pretty far, but he woke up every single day in his words, feeling like he was facing an existential crisis. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I could relate to that. I'm, I'm far from a U.S. Senator, a congressperson, but like I could relate to that feeling so deeply of uh, the way that I put it is that if I have a day, that's just a day, you know, I wake up, get the kids to school. I work, works over. I go to bed. <clears throat> that feels like a failure to me. Like if I'm not, mm. if I'm not notching a win in some way, it could be an email someone sends me every single day. I'm not on the, I'm not on the path. And I know that that makes no sense and that's exhausting, but um, it's become habitual. Yeah, I get you. I mean, my, I think I have a lot of thought. First of all, I just appreciate you for creating a space like, by the way, I'm, I, I mean, I'm pretty open about this stuff, but like, I'm telling stuff that I don't usually talk about. I feel very comfortable because I know the work you do. And I know the people in the room, yeah. we're all here because this is something we can all relate to. So I, I just want to acknowledge, like, I super value that you're having this conversation because it's so pervasive, but it's not talked about. Yeah. I would say two things. Number one is I think, uh, in general, what I've seen is for many of us, we do this because it works. It mm. works. We get results. And then, you know, when then what happens is it stops working. Like nobody has ever ridden this to the end of their lives because you always crash. And Bruce Feiler, who you, uh, you know you know as well, his book, uh, Life is in the Transitions, he talks about these life quakes and pile ups. Like at some point, these behaviors do sabotage your well being mm-hmm. and you will hit a wall. And I certainly did. And, you know, that's, I could talk about that, but that's, I had, I like crashed straight into the wall. The second thing is, and I had to change. The second thing is um, 
that your comment about a daily day, I, what I find actually, so this is interesting. I don't feel failure on a boring old day. What I feel is deep boredom. I'm like, wow, yesterday I had the dopamine hit of this cool thing that happened. And today the most exciting thing is I made some kanji. I am bored. <laughs> I had a therapist who said boredom is anger. Whoa. Yeah. Tell me more. Wow. She was I don't big even know. On that. She didn't believe in boredom. She was like, oh. boredom is suppressed anger. Oh, I don't I don't buy that. I'm not I don't either, angry but person. But I, I okay. Just, just, That's something I will I will think about next time. <laughs> something to think about. I never wow. get bored. Well, but why, no so why do to. you get right? But why do you, so that's so interesting to me. Like it just feels what boring, but what does the boring mean? For me, I've thought a lot about this. So you're asking me a question that I, that I feel like I'm working through. It's sort of like boredom means like, the, like you do, it's exciting to have the, the, um, especially when you work for yourself, but I think anybody, yeah. when you have a job, when you're doing work and you have the, those those big moments that you're saying, okay, like the path I'm on, I'm getting some validation that things are working versus a day where it's just the grind. You're like, I don't even know where this is going. Like, and the reality is those grind days are the majority of days and they only pay off later on. They are the ones, they are the days that create those exciting moments. So you can't have like, if every day were really exciting, you couldn't get the work done because the exciting days, like, you know, you're, you're running around being excited. But I do feel like you're like, okay, like last week, this really good thing happened. Like what's next for me? Will there be another thing? Or am I just going to, you know, is that it? Is that, was that the peak? And now we're just going is down again. It? Right. That's how I felt. And I probably sound like such an asshole right now, but um, I got nominated for this big award for Thinkers 50, which was yeah. a real goal of like, and when you work for yourself, you have no proof. There are no awards as adults. Doing. Where are all the awards? I want more. Yeah, I get you. Like, but you don't even get a paycheck. Like, no. you, you don't get a performance review. You don't get promoted. When you work for yourself, you never get promoted. You are in the same level so and same true. title your whole damn life. And so I know, like, no one's there to be like, your 360 review was amazing. I'll do that for you. But anyway, I get your point. <laughs> I and think you I, did a great job last year. Well, thank you. But I didn't do a year in review. But um, I got nominated for this big award. So that was finally mm. like a validation. Like, yes, I'm on to something. And it was something I was so proud of. Thinkers 50, leadership achievement, distinguished, blah, blah, blah. I was so proud. And then I lost. And I didn't expect to win. But, you know, mm. when you're nominated, you always want to win. And the day after... The day after was great because then I went to Google and I did a big thing that I've been working on for a long time. But like the week mm. after when I got home, I was really depressed. I thought, you didn't win. That's over. No, To your point, no one cared. No one noticed. Your life is exactly the same. You know, like, what's it all for? And um, even in my life of incredible privilege and accomplishment. And so, you know, these emotions are are really powerful. And I wonder if you have any advice, despite finding yourself and taking value in the real things, for those of us who are very achievement and career identified and are constantly seeking the milestones of external ticks on the boxes. Yeah. I had this very, I, this is, I'm going to tell a story now that makes me look terrible. Okay. But <laughs> Here since we we're doing that. <laughs> Cause like, again, I, 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 I hear some of the things that we're talking and like you, you named it like. I think like, I think back to five or six years ago, if these were my problems, I would have been like, that seems pretty good, man. Like what you yeah. complaining about? Cause like some of the stuff that I dreamed about doing and I've been able to do, um, I'm excited about, but what you start to realize too, is like, it's just like, there's no one thing, hmm. you know, like, like there's no one thing that solves your problems or makes you successful or whatever. It's a long journey. And so things that like, like I said, the Ted thing, like, I thought if I do that, like, I'll just be so successful. Well, you know, it, it helps. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's certainly part, but it doesn't really, I mean, it's just a part of the whole journey that you take. So I had this, this experience, um, that was like a good moment where I got some feedback from dear friends. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's really helpful. So I was, as I said, I, this, this, this documentary just came out 
this is not financial advice. It's super, it's a great, a great documentary. I I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's on Apple. It's like in the top five docs right now. So it's it's doing really great. And, and the, the producers are amazing. Like I'm super excited about the movie. Now I'm just a tiny little bit in this movie, right? The movie is, I mean, it's about pro and other folks, Kayla Kilbride, who's an influencer and whatever. But they they approached me uh, like two years ago and they said, hey, we're making this movie. Would you be willing to interview? It's got a FOMO component. Would you be willing to do it? And I was like, sure. And then they were supposed to come to New York and they didn't. And then like, I happened to be in LA. So we filmed out there and I spent like a couple hours with them and it was cool. It was nice. And they're nice people. And I had fun and whatever. And so um, then, you know, this, all this crap takes years, right? Like anything mm -hmm. that has any connection to showbiz, like you might as well just like plan a 19 year. <laughs> it's all slow, slow. I don't know how these people like deal with that, but I, um, they sent me uh, a year ago, they sent me a copy of the film and um, I saw it and there mm -hmm. I was in two little bits and it was cool. I was like, this is awesome. Like, I love it. And the film's really cool. And I loved it. And I was like, I'm just excited to be. I mean, yeah. Would I have loved to be in more scenes? Sure. Was I a little jealous of the person who was in more scenes? Sure. But I was like, this is cool. I'll admit that. And then they did a re-edit and they sent it to me again. And they're like, would we love you to just um, check it out and see what you think of the draft? And so I watched it and I was at the Apple store getting my computer fixed. So I'm watching it on my phone and I'm <laughs> scrolling to find myself. Of course, <laughs> God. I'm like, I'll watch this later. Where am I? And uh, I can't, I can't find myself. And so I emailed the director and he's like, yeah, sorry, this cut, you're not in it. And I, and I like felt super sad and yeah. I like went home and I sat on my couch and I was like, this sucks. I'm depressed. And then I, um, I ended up getting put back in as, a, but like, I, I actually like emailed the director and I was like, the movie's amazing. I just can't watch it because I'm too depressed. Sorry. Aww. Which is crazy. I mean, thank God. He must be like, I, I, I talked to him. He, I think you cared about it. I don't know. I, keep I did. And I was like, I was excited and I loved it. Um, but what happened was I started telling people I was really bummed. And several friends of mine were like, Patrick, since when do you outsource your self-esteem to other people? This is mm. crazy. You've totally lost it. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. Like, just because it's something new and shiny and bright and it's like exciting because I like excitement. Like if this were a job thing, if it were like, oh, you were up for a speaking gig and then it went to somebody else, it went to Mora, I'd be like, good for Mora. Like there'll be more. I lost perspective and I started to put my value in this, whether or not I was in this thing. And that was not in my control because at the end of the day, it's a film. They are directors. They're trying to make the best product possible. It's not about Patrick. And I think that that moment of temporary, you know, sort of loss of self I remember after that, I like actually made a big change. And I, I like the friend who, who really like, I had a friend who like really gave it to me on that one. And I, she's, she's come back to me. She's like, yeah, that was really weird. But like, it seems that you sort of, it really helped you to like, you kind of lost it a little bit. Mm. And I think that like that, um, I don't know where I was cause that's not my values. And I think it, I got sucked into all the excitement and the drama and all the, the stuff. But yeah, I'm in it. I'm back in it. And like, it's awesome. And I'm excited. Has it changed my life fundamentally? Am I getting calls from Reese Witherspoon asking me out on a date? No. <laughs> is she single? If you're watching, Re yes, she is. I've been monitoring. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, you get my point. That's a long winded version of that story. But the point is never, if you can, you know, really be aware of where you're deriving your sense of self-esteem. And, you know, understand that sometimes we get excited about things and we start to outsource that to other people when we may not even realize it. And I really look back on that. And I'm like, what was I thinking? You know, and now I try not to do that anymore, but I'm sure I will get sucked into something else. Like if I were up for Thinkers 50, I would be doing the same thing as you. I totally get that. I'm going to give Maggie, our listener, the last word. And Maggie, I'm going to read it for the podcast. Um, mm. Maggie writes, I'm just now beginning to unravel this unconscious need to be on the path all the time. I'm hardwired, accidentally passed down from mom, serve me in the world's well-being. I've crashed mm. over and over, finally laying down to rebuild, working hard with a team to locate authentic self with appropriate tools for right now, as opposed to the ones that got me here, competitive Ooh. achieving. Thank yeah. you both for your authenticity. Oh, Maggie, I feel like we feel you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we could have just read that in the beginning and <laughs> called just, it a day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that is so thoughtful. So thoughtful.
Okay, I'm going to give you the last word, Patrick. What's a practice that you do every day to tap into the values of who you want to be? Mm. You know, it's funny because it's one that didn't, it's like, I didn't expect it to give me this outcome. But about five years ago, my friend Ajay and I made a pact to start meditating every day. We both wanted to. And we made a, there's an app called Habit Share and we check in every day. It's like our accountability partners. And I started meditating for, you know, like health reasons just to be more relaxed and sleep better and, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, I never expected that it would have sort of fringe benefits or positive externalities around the FOMO stuff. But I also, um, I kind of integrated like a little, thanks to the advice of Jay Shetty, um, and talking to him, I integrated some gratitude stuff. So I'll think mm -hmm. about three things I'm thankful every day, just for a few minutes. Like I'll do the meditation that kind of towards the end, I'll be like, what are three things that I'm thankful for today to make that day not feel mundane, but feel special. Right. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it has made me, my ability to freak out, despite that story I just told you, it's declined like 88%. Wow. Wow. I just really... And it's, I'm shocked because like it's 10 minutes. It's not like I'm, I'm like, you know, living in a cave yeah. in, you know, the Parvati Valley of India, which would be nice too. But I really have found that. So what I would encourage people, I know like everybody's like, meditate, meditate. And I, I, it's interesting. I was at a conference recently of financial professionals working at this conference as a facilitator. And I was uh, people, one guy was like, I'm so type A, I don't know how to deal with that. And I said, do you meditate? Oh, I could never meditate. And everybody around the room was like, oh, just meditating is so hard. <laughs> Which I was that I was like, yeah, I know. I used to feel that way too. And I used to, my brother meditates every day. So I was like, how does he do it? Like, what, like, what is he like got he, that I do not have? And what I realized, and by the way, my 80 year old father started meditating soon to be wow. 80 next month, started meditating late last year and has told me about the impacts of it that he, he's like, I just finish it and I feel I have a smile on my face. And so what I want to say there and the inspiration of my dad is anybody can start anytime. Take five minutes, increase it to six the next month, then to seven, then to eight. And there's a million ways to learn this. And, you know, reach out to me. I can give you my tips. But I really encourage people to think of meditation not as something woo-woo. You can if you want, but it's just a practical way to give yourself a little something that is going to make your life richer, better, calmer, deeper, more enjoyable. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.